Welcome to the Rising Lioness podcast on All About Animals Radio, a place dedicated to animals and all those who act to protect and advocate for them. Hi, I'm your host, Erica Salvamini, and I'm thrilled and honored to be here representing All About Animals Radio using my voice for the animals. Thank you for joining us for what intends to be a thought-provoking and soul-inspiring series where we discuss topics aimed at understanding the importance of the relationship between empathy, animal rights, and our peaceful coexistence with the animal kingdom. And now on to our show. Welcome. Today we have Joe Anderson, who is an advocate for animals and empirical research. Joe has many years of experience with a wide range of social science research methods and topics, as well as advanced training in statistical analysis. Joe became Phonolytics Research Director in 2017, and since then has led and supervised studies of attitude and behavior pertaining to animals and veganism, advocate retention, donations, lobbying efforts, and many other topics. Her other roles include serving as the co-leader of RECAP, which is Research to End Consumption of Animal Products, also Researcher Collective, a member of the Animal Law and Science Working Group, an ad hoc research advisor to ProVeg and Food System Innovations, and an adjunct research professor at Carleton University of Ottawa, Canada. Jo has her PhD in social psychology from the University of Waterloo and completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University. Welcome, Jo. Thank you so much for being here today. That is quite an impressive resume. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's always an embarrassingly long list, but (laughs) thank you. It's, uh, well, you know what? You worked really hard to get that very long list, so... Definitely no embarrassment there. Um, I really appreciate that you're here. I'd love to talk um, today a little bit about phonolytics. And um, I thought actually we'd start out with explaining to the audience what phonolytics is, what they do, and how you started in your role with them. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, So I've been with phonolytics since 2016 when I started as a volunteer. And as you mentioned, my background is social psychology research. Uh, And what phonolytics is, is a group that does research uh, in order to help animal advocates be more effective in whatever type of advocacy they do to help protect, uh, support, and save animals. And so since then, I volunteered for a year, became the research director in 2017, and have been here ever since leading a growing team. At first, it was just me. Uh, on my own as a researcher, and now there are actually four of us, um, and we've grown a little every year the last few years, so it's pretty exciting, and uh, I am really proud of the work that we do helping all kinds of different animal advocates, whether that's uh, people doing legal work, direct uh, vegan or diet change outreach, uh, people doing lobbying campaigns, all kinds of different things. We provide data and uh, tools about what's most effective in order to help. I think that's amazing. Um, I absolutely love what you're doing and uh, what Phonolytics is doing. Um, Arming animal advocates with access to research analysis, um, strategies and messages in order to help them maximize their effectiveness, really for the sole purpose of reducing animal suffering is critically important. And I'd love to talk to you about Phonolytics, um, one of your recent studies that you've Um, worked on, which says that local laws can make a big impact on governments um, and what they're doing at the state level specifically, which I think points to creating meaningful change for animals, doesn't it? I think so too, yes. Um, So first, I just want to give credit to the first author on this project, uh, a law student. I myself am not a lawyer or legal scholar. uh, So Precious Hose is the one who ran this study for us. She's a law student at the Elizabeth Hobb School of Law at Pace University. Um, So she has the expertise and experience to be able to review legal literature uh, firsthand. Uh, And I was happy to be involved with the design of the study and uh, seeing how the results came out throughout. Um, But essentially what what Precious did was reviewed uh, the legal background behind different state laws in the US. Uh, to see what went into those 
uh, decisions, whether laws passed or did not pass, all pertaining to different animal protection issues. Um, and we looked at a few different issues uh, from declawing bans to bans on puppy mills, uh, to looking at plant-based procurement, uh, meaning government purchase of, of food products uh, and other things as well. It was, we had to choose a set of, of topics that were wide ranging, tried to focus more on issues related to animal farming, um, but just there are so many laws on the books regarding okay. animals in one way or another that we had to limit the focus in some way. So that's where we tried to focus more than others. Right. And so you looked at, well, what are some of the key findings that you came up with? Um, I think the first and the biggest uh, is what you alluded to when you introduced the study, the idea that uh, local action can be seemingly very influential, um, not just at a local level of legislation, but also at the state level. Um, by which I mean, sometimes it's possible within your own city uh, to create a law that then spreads to other cities nearby potentially, or even other parts of the country. Um, so we saw examples of laws that were established often in California um, in local municipalities, and then would spread to other municipalities uh, who use it as an example, like a law banning fur spreading from one municipality to another, and then eventually to the state level. So. Uh, by getting those things in place, even just in a single city, um, you can have a bigger difference than you would expect uh, right. just by creating that that precedent. And, and oftentimes it seemed like creating momentum as well, that once a few places take it on, it's easier to convince legislators that this is something that people care about, not just in that one city, but in this entire state or across the country, even if you can point to different jurisdictions that that have a particular law. Right. It, set, it sets a precedence and a, is a nice model for how to do it going forward. Do you see that that works better in bigger cities or is it just irrelevant, really, and it's just a matter of um, smaller, smaller local government versus, um, you know, starting at the, trying to start it at the state level? Hard to say. We didn't look at things in terms of the size of the municipalities involved, but what it did seem like is the more municipalities were involved, the more likely it was to have an impact at uh, at the state level. So, so grass, grassroots. Exactly, guess, um, yeah. If people need to, to understand, I guess, with this information that it, your voice makes a difference. You it know, does. If you want to see change, you have to be the change and and, and start it. Um, start you, you know, who are you not to do that, right? All of us can make a difference and make change happen. Exactly. And the extra point, the extra piece of that that I'll point out um, is not just making change in your own municipality being important. Um, it can spur momentum like that. But the other piece of it for it to have an influence at the state level is state legislators have to be aware that that has happened, that there are these multiple localities that have a law, for instance, banning the sale of foie gras or have a ban on puppy mills. Um, and what we found as well was that it wasn't always the case that during the debate process that people, people come in and testify as part of that process, they didn't always mention the local efforts. So the other piece of this is making sure and this is something we can do as grassroots advocates as well, making sure that state legislators are aware that there are all of these examples of bills that have been passed at state levels, um, that there are all these people who really care about these issues. And one of the things that our report does is there's this very long set of tables at the end of the PDF where you can see just a list of all of the different places that different things have passed, which if you are going to be potentially calling up a legislator, uh, whether it's a senator or congressperson, um, you can use those as examples, things to talk about, about where things have passed previously. That's amazing. So you don't have to be in the animal you know, activist wet world or realm, you could just be a regular person who's got maybe a little extra time on your hands and wants to make a difference. And they can pull up a the Phonolytics website and look at your library 
and just kind of look at and and kind of scroll through, right? If say uh, I love sea otters, I want to see if there's anything that's been passed locally to help sea otters or wolves or whatever. Um, or you know, if you're you're big on trying to ban foie gras in your area, they can just look up those studies or those laws that have passed on your website, right? And like start to contact their local um, governments. I mean, is, is it as simple as that? Can people do that? Close, close. Okay. So for the topics that we covered in this report, you can find all of the, the laws listed right in the report. For things that were not part of it, um, we are happy to help you. We have these pro bono office hours where people can come and sit with us face to face. Right. Um, and we will help you find other things. So if it's not in this report, if it's something that we didn't cover, right. um, sea otters, for instance, unfortunately, are not in there. Right. Um, <laughs> but we would be happy to help point you to legal databases where you can just search for things like that that might be helpful. That's amazing. I just think that uh, it's it's an incredible service that you're providing um, for for the animals, for for us, for the people who love animals and want to protect them. Um, I think that's just fabulous. Uh, I have a question, which I think I might know the answer to, but I want to ask because I, I want to know the answer. I don't know, I, hopefully you can help me with that and, and also for our, our listeners can um, hear as well. And I was just wondering if, if there are any laws that currently exist which protect animals in big money industries like you know animal industries, like the pet industry or factory farming or the exotic animal trade, which I can't even believe I am saying that that's an actual industry that exists, but it does. And so are there laws that, that are protecting animals in these industries? Do you know? There are. It it varies. Uh, there's a huge difference between different cause areas. So one of the things that we really recommend is that people if you have a specific issue that you care a lot about, you need to learn about that particular issue. Um, and some of those are covered in, in the report that we put out. So uh, just touching on a little bit of that, uh, with respect to factory farming, it is such a tricky area, uh, especially because uh, at the local level, municipalities are what's called preempted from creating any laws themselves around the treatment of farmed animals in most, if not all states, um, which means that the state itself has laws in place that prevent a city from, from protecting animals better than the state does. That's horrific. I can't even believe that that is, I, I, I can believe it. And it, I, sh I should say it doesn't shock me, but it does still shock me. Yeah. So it's really unfortunate. It's done exactly for the reasons you would think to prevent cities from, from having more power than the state wants them to have. Uh, and it means that it's more difficult in those cases for grassroots advocates to get involved. There else are still things that you can do at the city level um, to create, for instance, non-binding resolutions where a city can call on the state to change a law. Uh, but it doesn't have a direct legal impact. I was going to say, I'm sure that's not an easy thing to do. And I'm sure it's probably very time consuming and they, they hold it up and don't like to have that happen. So I'm sure it's not easy. <laughs> right. That being said, right. uh, with the other areas that you talked about, uh, as I said, there's such a huge range. So that's kind of the worst case scenario at the moment are those preempted uh, preemptions that are in place around farming. But on the flip side, uh, things like puppy mills and pet retail have seen a lot of success. Uh, there are actually over 400 municipalities throughout the U.S. that have banned uh, puppy mill sales uh, or the sale of animals in stores from breeders. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of success there, a lot of momentum. And you can see in the history that even with something like that, where there was a lot of support, that it's not perfectly smooth sailing the whole way. Right. Um, there will be a lot of pushback uh, during that process, but there are regulations in place in many areas and actually more still uh, that are coming up today. There's there's one uh, right now in Massachusetts, a bill that would prohibit the retail sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits. Um, so these are things that are continuing and 
actually along those lines, I want to give just a quick shout out to anyone who is interested in learning what's current in terms of animal protection laws, if you want to try and help and get involved. Um, the Brooks Institute org has an animal law digest that puts out just weekly updates on what's going on in the world of animal protection laws um, that is super useful for staying up to date knowing what you can do to to help at any given time that's amazing that's really great information thank you and at the end of um we'll post not just formalytics website but we'll also put in the brooks institute and right. so make it easier for people to go ahead and, and click on that and check out these organizations afterwards to, um, yeah, there's things that we can all do and we don't have to feel like, oh, it's, it's too big and too beyond me. I I'm overwhelmed by it. And how could I possibly make a difference? I'm just little me in my little place here. And, um, cause that's not the case and everybody can make a difference. And the more of us that use our voices and we, we, collectively we can make a tremendous difference as evidenced by all the all the studies that you guys are doing and, and putting out so bravo i think that's fabulous um thank you and then yeah absolutely and then what any any information on the exotic animal trade industry do you know anything about that so that wasn't something that we covered in this particular report but we do have um a previous report on our website, if you go to the section for Faunalytics Original Studies, yeah. uh, where we looked at the wildlife trade, legal wildlife trade, I should say, in and out of the US. And without going into a ton of detail, the numbers there are staggering for, again, all legal product uh, brought into the United States, whether that is live animals in many cases, um, pieces of various types, trophies, um, all kinds of things. So the numbers there are really pretty staggering and uh, we have breakdowns of all of that. Uh, yeah, so at, essentially the bottom line there is it is regulated, but uh, any animal advocate looking at the data would probably say it's not regulated enough. All of these things are legal. Right, that's the point is that it's legal. And yeah. why is it legal? I was uh, just recently, I just recently learned that you know, I mean, I knew that it existed, these canned hunting ranches where people with lots and lots of money, too much money to to, to do anything. They, they just, they don't know what to do with their money anymore. So they're using it to go in and do these canned hunts at these ranches where people go for fun. Mm -hmm. And they just, you can go to, and from what I understand, Texas has lots and lots of them. I'm not picking on Texas. I'm just saying that just happens to be a place where I know that there are, are um, dozens of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, how does that, how is that allowed? How does that, how does that exist? And you can go there and in Texas, you can shoot, you know, animals that don't even belong in this country. Um, zebras and lions and tigers and all sorts of, uh, you know, kangaroos. And, you know, I don't think people really understand that a lot of people don't understand that this type of entertainment, if you can call it entertainment, this blood sport, these, these things exist and they exist within the confines of our own country. And you could just be, you know, going about your business and not even know that in your backyard and that this kind of stuff goes on and exists. So if people do want to make a difference and speak up and speak out and say, Hey, you know what? I don't like this. And I don't want my taxpayer money going to help and support these kinds of businesses and organizations. I want, I want to have a say in that. And mm -hmm. so do you have any suggestions for people and what they could do to, to maybe who don't like that could, could speak up and speak out against it? Absolutely. Um, anything like that, if it is in a municipality where uh, you're able to speak to your, your local counselors, um, I think that sort of thing is always a really good starting point. Yeah. Um, I don't know the specifics for every type of law, whether it's regulated at the municipal level, but even if it's not, starting with your counselors, those are the ones who are closest to you and most likely to talk to you quickly. Um, yeah. Although you might find that even at the state level, legislators are surprisingly responsive and willing to have calls. It just, there might be a substantial delay. Sure. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely talk to them, make your voice heard. And if you can bring in other people, um, numbers really matter when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, 
And just to add on one other kind of example to yours, which is a great one, the idea that there are more tigers captive in the United States than there are in the wild in the rest of the world, um, because largely of roadside zoos and small pens where they're kept captive just for entertainment purposes. And yeah, there's way too many things like that, that that are allowed to continue and that probably there are people out there right now listening or watching who do care and just don't know how to get involved. So I would say the first step, apart from a Google to see if there's a group working specifically on that issue, um, which in the case of Tigers in America, there is, uh, yeah. apart from that, just talking to your local representatives, um, making your voice heard. Yeah, we're, we're constituents. We actually, we matter. Mm -hmm. they, they need us. They need us, you know, more than we need them that we, you know, we vote them in and we're the ones that get to make a say, have a say in the laws and what goes on. So folks, please, if you're listening, um, you know, and you want to make a difference, start with um, Joe's suggestions, you know, just a Google search or go on, uh, you know, contact your local representatives and ask them about this and see what you can do. Um, and you know what, I would say, especially in areas where you feel like sometimes you can feel like in a particular area, the political leaning is such that maybe you feel out of place having these kinds of concerns. Right. Um, and I think that's the case where you can actually make the most difference by calling, because if you don't reach out, then the majority viewpoint, um, if it is the majority viewpoint, is likely the only one that the legislator is aware of. And even just a few voices from a minority viewpoint reaching out and making the case can make a bigger difference than the silent majority. That's a really great point and a great perspective. So thank you for sharing that. Because frankly, you know, most people are busy and are overworked and tired and just trying to get by and survive in their life and taking care of family, taking care of themselves, whatever the case may be, and want to make a difference, but don't necessarily know how, because, you know, well, how can I, because I don't have the time and I don't have the resources and I don't have the this and the that, but this is a great help to, to know how to go about it and know that it's, it's really not that big of a deal. You just need a little bit of time on your hands to maybe make a call or send a letter, send an email mm -hmm. and, and your voice does make a difference. And if you have friends or colleagues or peers or anybody who feels the same way, like, like you were saying, Joe, just a few voices, if you don't want to go at it alone, have you and your friends make some phone calls and uh, you make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all great and valuable information. Um, you know, what you guys are doing, making animal advocates more successful in their work is vital, which is why I hope more of them will utilize phonolytics as a resource because, um, you know, supporting and furthering their service within the animal protection movement is huge. And that's basically what phonolytics, you, you exist to do that. So exactly. Yeah. You don't feed folks out there, your animal advocates, uh, you don't have to go at it alone. There's, a, there's so much information, valuable information out there that Phonolytics has been doing for you. You can check out their website at www.phonolytics.org. Um, we'll also have it on, on our website on the profile for this podcast um, or on YouTube, whichever you're, whether you're listening or watching. Um, they have accumulated years of actionable and insightful data that you can access and utilize from their library today. All free, by the way. All free. Um, I mean, that's amazing. No sign up needed, though you're welcome to if you want the email alerts. And we also, as I mentioned, have the one on one pro bono support um, if you have specific questions or need that's any help. Phenomenal. Are you guys like, um, how are you, how, how do you support yourselves? Do you have advertisements? Do you have our advertisers, backers, sponsors? How do you, how do you do this? We have a combination of large and small donors. A lot of our support comes from just individuals who have a few bucks to throw away now and then. Uh, but we have some large donors as well and some grants that we apply for for the research that we do. That's so, so great. That's amazing. It's also, you know, it's empowering. It gives you hope that we're not the only ones out there that that believe in this. And I know we're not because I talk to people every day all the time and and more and more people every day are just 
it's just a matter of the awareness, bringing the awareness and educating and people are just like, what, this is going on? I didn't know. And mm -hmm. the more people hear, the more they want to know and the more they want to help, which is amazing. And Joe, your work and phonolytics and everybody that you work with are just amazing. I applaud you. And I thank you so much for being here today, for talking to our audience. It's been an honor and a pleasure speaking with you truly. And I hope phonolytics noble and much needed work continues to flourish and grow. And I hope that we can connect again in the future on any of the important studies that you're doing that are aimed at helping animals to you know, reduce their suffering and increase their happiness and peace in life. So you're welcome anytime, please. <laughs> thank you so much, Erica. And it was, it was pleasure being here. I'm so happy to talk to you and thank you for the work that you're doing to get our work out there because without that aspect of getting it out to advocates, everything we do would be without point. So it's really a collaborative effort for the whole community. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, right back at you. So have a wonderful day. Thank you, listeners, and we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. This has been Erica Salvamini for the Rising Lioness podcast on All About Animals Radio. A special thank you to Chris Corley for generously lending us his song, Zero Gravity, for the Rising Lioness podcast theme. Please take a moment to write a review for our show as it helps others to find us. Please also support our guests and their work, All About Animals Radio and our social networks. Doing this further supports the animals and their advocates too, thereby making you an Animal Kingdom warrior also. You can find our links on the Rising Lioness podcast page. Until next time, in the words of Sharon Nunez, Animal Equality President, remember this, the small actions of one passionate individual can create a butterfly effect leading to a movement that has the power to change the world. Please use your voice for the animals today.